Thanks, Kelsey. Thanks everybody for being here. See some familiar names. Um, I'm Karen Hills. I'm with the Washington State Conservation Commission um, and I manage a grant program called Sustainable Farms and Fields that some of you may be familiar with. Um, this is a relatively new grant program that is meant to make it easier and more affordable for farmers and ranchers uh, to implement climate smart practices. So practices that increase carbon sequestration and or reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So it's my pleasure today to introduce Danny Gilardi, um, who's here to speak with us. So Danny is the senior soil scientist and climate coordinator at the Washington State Department of Agriculture, where she leads soil and climate efforts for the agency, including the Washington Soil Health Initiative. Um, Danny is also adjunct faculty at Washington State University in the Department of Crop and Soil Sciences, and she received her PhD and master's in soils and biogeochemistry from uh, UC Davis. All right, and with that, go ahead and take it away, Danny. Thanks so much, Karen and Kelsey. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay, great. Hi, everyone. I am Danny Gilardi. I am very excited to be here today to talk about understanding soil tests, some broad uh, lessons on how to get good soil results, uh, how to take soil samples, and how to interpret soil tests. And before I get started, I just want to acknowledge that Deirdre Griffin LeHue, who is a WSU assistant professor at Mount Vernon, uh, is the one who originally pioneered this slide deck. So I've adapted many of the slides, but she is also a co-author on this. So um, just to go over what we'll talk about today, we're gonna start by defining some terms. We'll talk about how soil tests have changed over time from thinking about fertility to then quality to then soil health, where we are now today. And then we'll go back to basics, talking about why some very old school measurements like pH and texture are still so important for understanding how to interpret soil tests. And then we'll start to get into that brave new world of soil health indicators, all kinds of uh, carbon pools, soil aggregates, and soil microbes, of which there are many, many different measurements. And then we'll talk about some best practices, how to both get and interpret quality results. So let's start by defining terms. Uh, I think a lot of people in the room who've been working in soil science and soil stewardship for a long time probably remember when we just talked about fertility and we largely asked ourselves about how can we manage soils to support crop growth. And then sometime around the 90s, really led by the Natural Resource Conservation Service or the NRCS, we started talking instead about soil quality. And we started asking, how can we manage soils given inherent soil properties to support crop growth and minimize degradation? So the shift from fertility to quality paved the way for thinking about soil sustainability. And it also made room for tailoring management to the unique properties of different soils, from the slope of the land to the texture or organic matter content of the soil. And then we have soil health, where the, the question has sort of ballooned. And we really now talk about how can we steward soil ecology, given inherent soil properties to support multiple functions and minimize degradation. The, the soil health movement has really newly recognized that soils have a function beyond crop growth. They filter air and water, they store carbon, they reduce the effects of climate change, they contain cultural significance, support recreation, and, and so on and so forth. Um, but of course, they grow crops and in the process ensure food security and thriving rural economies. So I like to show this graphic just to illustrate how soils are the literal platform on which societies are built. And it's our job as land managers and technical assistance providers and, and producers to make sure we are stewarding that soil ecology to promote these ecosystem services. So I think everyone in the room probably knows about the pillars of how to manage soil uh, soils in a, in a healthy way. Uh, we want to minimize soil disturbance. This could be reduced tillage. Uh, we want to increase biodiversity. That can be through crop rotation or through intercropping or integrating livestock. 
keep a continual living root in the ground. So really trying to reduce fallow periods and increase cover cropping, maximizing soil cover, again, reducing uh, the fallow period and cover cropping, intercropping, uh, crop rotations, and then integrating livestock. So I won't talk too much about that. The NRCS has tons of resources on these practices and their impacts. Um, but what I do wanna talk today about is even if you are implementing all of those tenants of soil health, how do you measure it and, and how do you quantify the impacts of your management? So we like to think about soil health indicators in three different buckets, the chemical, biological, and physical indicators of soil health. And like I said, soil health really newly recognizes that there's a whole soil microbial community uh, helping us promote ecosystem services and, and performing a lot of the work that soils do. And so there are a lot of new indicators to help us measure all of those uh, different microbial metrics. And we'll go over some of that. But let's start with just the chemical indicators. These old school measurements like electrical conductivity or pH, of course, macro and micronutrients, which most producers are very, very interested in for obvious reasons. Uh, we also have different physical measurements, texture, water holding capacity, bulk density, and then these microbial metrics. So mineralizable nitrogen, carbon, oxidizable carbon, so protein, enzymes, phospholipid fatty acids, and microbiome data. The list gets really, really long and can sometimes feel a little overwhelming. So I like to just point out that these indicators are really similar to vital signs for the human body. Alone, your heart rate may not tell you that much, but when you combine it with other vital signs like blood pressure and temperature, the indicators start to provide an overall snapshot of soil health. And, and soil health or of, of human health and soil health indicators are really similar in that they're most useful when interpreted together and in the context of their unique farm management systems. So I know a lot of you have received soil health reports over the years, whether that be for biological, chemical, or microbial indicators. And sometimes these reports can lead to more questions than answers. And to keep things simple today, we're going to just try to talk about things in terms of whether or not you want that indicator to be higher, lower, or if there's an optimal range. I try to avoid being prescriptive and saying that for your soil to be healthier, you need 50 parts per million of this specific indicator. Because the truth is that's not how soils work. We know they're really diverse and management itself is also really diverse. So we're gonna frame things in terms of these three symbols, which you'll see throughout the presentation. And before I start talking about individual indicators, I do want to first plug some of the work that the Washington Soil Health Initiative is doing, which is a statewide tri-agency project, uh, a partnership between Washington State University, Washington State Department of Agriculture, where I work, and the Washington State Conservation Commission, which of course most of you are tapped into. Together, we work on promoting soil health through many, many projects uh, surrounding outreach and education, policy support, research, and technical, uh, technical assistance. But one project I want to talk about is the State of the Soils Assessment, where we have actually attempted to better understand soil health indicators through a statewide soil sampling project. And I think a lot of the folks in the room today have participated both by taking samples and connecting us to growers and helping growers understand the reports that we distribute. So far, we have sampled over 700 sites in 50 different cropping systems. We've analyzed each of these samples for 30 soil health indicators, and we have 26 counties covered in Washington so far. And the objective is really to understand how climate, crop, and management impact those soil health indicators. So here you can see a map of where we've taken the samples, and we pair each of those samples with management surveys. Uh, so we can start to develop a landscape scale understanding of how practices like cover cropping or reduced tillage impact some of these indicators. We also want to develop crop and region specific decision support tools. So a lot of you are probably familiar with the soil health scoring curves I'm showing on this screen. Uh, these are incredibly useful for 
getting a sense of where your soil health indicator matches up against um, against the project average or against other soil samples. But the truth is, is that the ones that are currently available from Cornell were largely based on soils data sets that have nothing to do with Washington soils, different textures, different mineralogies, different cropping systems. And so it can be really challenging to try and compare your soils with soils that um, really bear little resemblance to yours. For example, one of my favorite soil health indicators is permanganate oxidizable carbon or POC C. And you can see here with this Cornell uh, scoring curve that the top 20% of their samples had between 600 and 1200 ppm of POC C. If you were a producer in dryland Washington and you sent your soil over to Cornell, you would be told perhaps that you had low soil health or that you were far below average for that indicator, because in the washi dryland context, 0% of our samples were between 600 and 1200 ppm. You can see that our scale doesn't even go up that high. And that's not because our soils are less healthy, but because they're just really different. We have different irrigation regimes, different cropping systems, and again, different soils themselves. And so we are working to develop these scoring curves for each of the indicators in multiple Washington contexts, whether that be dry land or whether that be Western Washington um, and all kinds of different cropping systems. And I also wanna say that you may be looking at this scoring curve here and saying, oh, well, of course it's low, it's, it's dry land agriculture. They don't irrigate and it's, it's such a unique system. But actually Molly McElwam of, w, of Washington State University has done similar soil health scoring curves for grape systems, for example, um, vineyard uh, juice and wine grapes, and found that the range is similarly caps at around 700 ppm. So it's not just a dry land situation, it's that all of our cropping systems need region and crop specific scoring curves for Washington. And then of course, another objective of our project is to better help producers and ag professionals assess their own soil health. So we have taken all of the management data, all the soil sampling data, we put it into a system and it spits out customized soil health reports for every producer or participant in our project. So far, we've distributed over 200 reports containing data for over 700 fields. And even though these reports are really long, there are something like 12 pages and they compare every field against the project average, against averages from that specific crop or that specific county. So there are many ways to evaluate your soil. Um, so even though there's all of that data, there's still a lot of questions to be asked. Some soils data can be confusing. And the more indicators that have come online, the more it can feel like you need advanced degrees to interpret soil health reports. And, and I really want to stress that that isn't true. Soils data is confusing, but there are some really um, overarching principles that can be helpful when soil sampling and when um, reading soil sample results. So I will be touching on these throughout the rest of the presentation, but overall, we wanna remember the basics. We wanna make sure we understand that context matters. We wanna be consistent and we wanna be patient. And we'll go over each of these um, for the remainder of this talk. So, let me start uh, when I say remember the basics by taking us back to some of the most essential and fundamental soil health, uh, soil health indicators, which is soil texture. We all know that this is a mixture of sand, silt, and clay. I think a lot of people are familiar with this textural triangle where you can add up the percent of each of those size fractions. But I want to put into perspective really what what does sand, silt, and clay content mean for your soil? Even though these different particles may look very similar to the naked eye, the truth is that sand is so, so much larger than clay. And here you can kind of see the relative size difference. We are talking about the difference between a basketball, a golf ball, and a poppy seed. So these are vastly different in size. And because of that, they have vastly different properties. For example, they hugely impact soil hydrology. 
a clay soil may have trouble with infiltration and, and you'd get ponding on the surface, whereas a sandy soil may have trouble with water holding capacity and the water just leaches right through. Ideally, you would have a nice loamy soil, which is a great mixture of those three particles. But of course, uh, you don't necessarily get to choose which soil you farm in. That's just what is there and cannot be changed with management. In addition to impacting hydrology, it also has a lot to do with your cation exchange capacity. So clay particles have a really high surface area and a really electrical, electrically charged surface area. So the more clay you have in your soil, the more likely you are to have high cation exchange capacity and have the ability to hold on to base cations like magnesium, potassium, or calcium. So if you want to measure soil texture, one of the easiest ways is to scan this QR code and go to the NRCS Soil Web app. It will provide you with uh, the CERGO or, or an interface for the CERGO database where you can actually click and find out what is the soil texture of the land that you stand on right now. That's just an overarching snapshot. There are some inconsistencies, the data may not be up to date, or perhaps um, your region may be an exception to the overall map unit. So it's also good to try to measure your soil texture in the lab as well. Almost all labs do it, it's not terribly expensive. And one of the good things to know is that because your soil texture does not change with management, you really only need to measure it once. Or if you're interested, you know, every 10 years or every 20 years, but measuring it once will help you understand why your soil behaves the way it does in terms of water holding capacity or cation exchange capacity. And another thing to note is that soil texture is incredibly variable. And I think a lot of people understand this uh, better than I could just from managing their lands. You may have a pocket of really clay heavy soil, a pocket of really uh, sandy soils. It varies across the field and by depth. Now let's talk about cation exchange capacity. I talked about this a little bit already by mentioning that clay is a big driver of CEC. So cation exchange capacity is literally just the number of negatively charged sites in your soil. Negatively charged sites that can hold on to positively charged cations. You can measure cation exchange capacity in almost any lab. You can measure it every five to 10 years. It also doesn't change very often because again, your clay content isn't going to change. It is affected by pH. It's affected by clay content and organic matter content. And it determines how much of those base cations you can hold. One thing to note is that just because you have high CEC does not necessarily mean that you also have high fertility. Those sites could also be totally full of hydrogen ions or, or acidic ions, for example. So it's good to have your cation exchange capacity measurement in combination with uh, measurements of potassium, calcium, and magnesium. Now let's talk about soil pH, another very old school measurement, but one that impacts almost all other soil properties. So we know that uh, soil pH is the activity of hydrogen ions in soil solution. So over at the left end, we have a ton of hydrogen ions, and this is where we have acidic pHs on the range of zero to five. Then over at the right, we have very few hydrogen ions, and that's where we get into basic soil pHs in a range of nine to 14. And ideally you wanna be somewhere in that optimal range, six, seven, or eight, especially for agricultural production. And again, pH impacts so many other properties. So you can see over at the acidic end, you have all of those negatively charged sites satisfied with hydrogen ions. In the center, you have a good mix of hydrogen ions and, and base cations. And then over all, over all the way to the right at the basic end, you have tons of base cations. So your pH will actually impact what is able to hold on to those exchange sites. And it also impacts the availability of essential crop nutrients. So you can see here in the center of this diagram, most of the essential nutrients are green, indicating that they are uh, particularly available to crops at those pHs. When you get down here at the bottom, you can see that things like iron, manganese, and aluminum are actually much, much more available at acidic pHs. This can lead to crop toxicity. 
Iron and manganese in small quantities are essential for crop growth, but at larger quantities can be toxic. And of course, that's true for aluminum as well. And this also impacts the microbial communities that can inhabit your soil. So people in the soil health community love to talk about how important it is to measure soil microbial metrics. But the truth is that you can tell a lot about which microbial groups are in your soil just by knowing the pH. As you can see here, fungi tend to be um, really resilient across pH scales, whereas some bacteria and actinomycetes are less likely to survive at acidic pHs. So in my opinion, this is one of the most important things to measure and lucky it is also one of the easiest things to measure. If you want to do it in a lab, any lab will do it costs 10 bucks. You can do it every single year. This is especially important because pH can slowly creep over time. Fertilizers can acidify soil. Uh, pH will change with organic matter content. So it is important to be tracking this over time. Another good piece of news is that if there is an issue with pH, there are management practices which can change it. You can lower it with sulfur, and raise it with lime. And if you don't want to send it away to a lab, you can also measure it yourself uh, in your farm field by buying one of these probes. And there are a range of probes out there, anywhere from 30 to $500, depending on what you want. Okay, crop fertility measurements. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this today because I really wanna focus on uh, more of the newer soil health indicators, but of course, crop fertility is one of the most important things to drive soil function like crop growth and crop quality. There are 17 essential plant nutrients, 18 if you count silica, which is a bit controversial in the soils community. Uh, you can see that your macronutrients need to be in much larger quantity than your micronutrients, but all of these are important to measure uh, micronutrients probably less frequently. If you want to measure these, um, one important lesson to know is that different crops have very, very different nutrient needs. And so again, we won't talk about that today, but it is important that you aim for the optimal range for your specific cropping system. And uh, I have included a QR code and a resource for something that talks much more about soil fertility. Okay. Annie? Yeah. Is this a good pause point? There's a couple of questions. Oh yeah, that please. I can't see the um, chat, but any that's anyone okay. who has questions, that's jump in. That's why I'm here. <laughs> yeah, great. Um, so Sarah um, had asked, will you talk about pH versus buffer capacity? Yeah, so um, buffer capacity is also, if you recall on this slide, maybe I'll go back. If you recall on this slide uh, where I'm talking about pH, but I'm showing how it impacts cation exchange capacity, those two measurements in combination really help you uh, know about your buffer capacity because the higher cation exchange capacity you have, the higher buffering capacity you have. Buffering capacity is the soil's ability to supply nutrients or to resist a change in nutrient supply. So high CEC and neutral pHs will likely lead to a higher buffering capacity. It's also important to factor in things like soil mineralogy. So if you have um, soils with a parent material that are higher in magnesium and potassium and calcium, those are more likely to occupy the exchange sites here and also uh, more likely to be supplied to your crops. Great. The other question that came up, uh, and Sarah says, thank you, by the way. Yeah. Uh, Darla asked, I was told liming can take up to 10 years to have optimal effect and is therefore not always a good amendment. Is this valid? Yeah, of course, again, it, it depends on your buffering capacity and your soil texture. And sometimes I, I think being a soil scientist can be a little unsatisfying to people because the answer is almost always it depends <laughs> but yes that is valid I think it's important to remember that the soil the bulk soil is immense and deep and vast and so no matter how much of an amendment you supply to that soil it's going to be very small compared to what's already there so yes lime needs to be applied over time uh, I think people apply it every one to three years to maintain or increase pH and um, 
you know, it's definitely an investment, both in terms of labor and costs. So I think there, there's a lot of validity to that. Great. If there's any questions anyone else has, this is a good time to type them in the chat before we move forward. One way that you can buffer against changes in pH is also to raise your soil organic matter. But of course that takes, you know, sometimes much longer than 10 years. So that's something to note is that there are um, other ways to buffer against changes in pH, but they also are a, a time and uh, resource investment. Okay. That's a great segue to talking about soil organic matter. So um, this is another, uh, not particularly new or novel metric that has that impacts every other metric that we talk about except for maybe soil texture. So soil organic matter is measuring complex carbon-based molecules, mostly microbial. And you'll notice that people are obsessed with talking about soil organic matter. And that's because it is really the rich brown batter from which all cakes are baked. It is incredibly, incredibly important. So soil organic matter is formed as plants sequester atmospheric carbon and they store that carbon in their vegetative bodies or exude it through their roots. Then the microbes take those uh, plant materials, whether the exudates or the dead plants, manure, compost, dead macro and microfauna, all kinds of different carbon sources, and they process it into soil organic matter. And again, this has so many impacts on your soil. Soil organic matter, like clay, is very, very high in cation exchange capacity, in fact, even higher. So if you want to raise your CEC, the best way to do it is to work on raising your soil organic matter. It also has a lot to do with hydrology. So even if you had a really, really heavy clay soil, by increasing your soil organic matter, you can improve the way that water moves through that soil. Same if you had a really sandy soil, you can hold on to more water for longer if you improve your soil organic matter. Soil organic matter is also really easy to measure. Almost every lab does it. It's not terribly expensive. Uh, one of the good pieces of news is that you don't need to measure it every year because it is pretty slow to change. So if you were to begin reducing your tillage or uh, integrating livestock, the truth is your soil organic matter isn't going to change that same year you do it. It's really an investment and takes time. And it's good to know that it's impacted by context and management. So the management practices I just mentioned can help you increase soil organic matter, but there are also inherent limitations. Texture matters, climate matters. It's much, much easier to have high soil organic matter if you have a lot of rainfall or in a cooler climate. The age of your soil matters too, and that's something that you as a land manager can not do anything about. So it's always important to try to increase your soil organic matter with management, but know that um, there may be inherent limitations. Another uh, good thing to know is that soil organic matter is roughly 58% organic carbon. So if you have one or the other of those measurements already in hand, you can just quickly convert back and forth between them. You don't need to pay for both. And a big thing that I want to talk about today is that not all soil organic matter is created equal. And this is because soil organic matter has different what are typically called pools or different bins where carbon can be stored for variable lengths of time. And because of this, there are a lot of new measurements aimed at um, describing those different pools, how much carbon is in them and how long it will last. So just to provide a quick carbon cycle lesson here, as I mentioned, carbon inputs come in through plants and organic amendments, and then microbes process them in different ways throughout the microbial life cycle. And in an ideal system, a lot of that carbon makes it all the way to the end here, where it becomes associated with the mineral content of your soil. That's where it's thought to be the most protected from degradation or oxidation or erosive forces. And so this is all well and good. Management will help you. Having an active microbial community will help you. But it's also really important to note that those same microbes that help build soil organic matter 
also need to use that soil organic matter as an energy source for their own metabolism and population growth. So while your microbes are storing organic matter, they are also mineralizing it and in the process, respiring some of it as CO2. And this is also a big driver of crop growth. If your microbes did not mineralize your soil organic matter, you would have a much lower nutrient supply as well. So this sometimes gets lost in the conversation when we talk about climate smart agriculture or soil carbon sequestration. Soil is an incredible store for carbon, but agriculture necessarily and inherently exploits that carbon for crop production. And so there are always trade-offs between ecosystem services and, and food production. Another way to think about this is really like the microbes are a factory and this factory powers a broad range of ecosystem services, which you can see to the right of this figure. Uh, and in the process, they both use and store soil organic matter like a battery. And you can see in that battery, there are both short-term and long-term carbon pools. And I would like to talk a little bit about those pools. So permanganate oxidizable carbon is one fairly affordable and easy to perform test that helps you measure a newly microbially processed form of soil organic carbon. So if you recall, I mentioned that soil organic matter is really slow to change and it can be difficult to measure whether or not your management has an impact. But POC C actually changes much, much quicker. And so people are measuring this to look at uh, whether or not your management may lead to long-term carbon stabilization. You can measure this um, in most labs. You can measure it every year, especially if you've implemented a practice change and want to see if your practice is having an effect. And uh, one thing to note is that this used to be called active carbon, and the scientific community has moved away from using that term. But if you see active C, uh, it's the same thing as POC C. Another interesting pool of soil organic matter is called mineralizable carbon. And this is just literally the carbon dioxide that is given off of a soil after wetting it in an incubation. It's also called respiration or the Solvita burst test. And this is an amazing measurement because it's a proxy for how active your microbes are or how much microbially available carbon there is in your soil. Again, this changes much more quickly and uh, really is a perfect in situ snapshot of how again, how likely your microbes are to process uh, recently added carbon or how much carbon there is for them to process. So like carbon, soil nitrogen is also very complex, has many pools and has many transformations. So I just wanna talk broadly about the inorganic and organic components of this very uh, text heavy nitrogen cycle diagram. So- Danny? Yeah. Before you launch into that, a couple questions have come up. Yeah, please. Would it be all right to pause for yeah. a minute? Um, so Savannah has had asked a little earlier in your slide deck, um, you mentioned the age of the soil. Does that mean the amount of time it was in a certain productive system or something else? I actually was talking about it in terms of geologic time. So how, what, uh, geologic events led to that soil formation? Was it, you know, 100,000 years ago? Was it 10,000 years ago? As soils age, they become, they on the whole, become more clay heavy, more acidic. Uh, a lot of the base cations or fertility will leach through the soil profile. So if you are farming in an area with really, really old parent material, it can be harder to achieve soil organic matter increases. So yeah, I was, I didn't mean to um, describe anything to do with management, really, again, things beyond the land manager's control. Okay, great. She says, thank you. Um, Megan asked, should farmers be concerned with tests that show high levels of organic matter in their fields? Generally speaking, more soil organic matter is better for many different reasons. As I've been describing, um, more cation exchange capacity, more fertility, more climate change mitigation potential. However, a lot of soil organic matter can also lead to management challenges. Uh, I think anyone who has tried to farm on a peat-like soil or 
really high OM content soil knows that it can be quite a bog <laughs> after a rain. It can sometimes invite pests and disease because there are so many uh, incredible carbon sources for different uh, different macro and megafauna that may live, uh, excuse me, micro and megafauna that would live in your soil. So a farmer shouldn't be concerned unless they are experiencing management challenges and then they may link it to high soil organic matter, but that doesn't mean you'd want to destroy your soil organic matter to alleviate the management challenges. It's a very important terrestrial carbon sink that we should, should definitely protect. Wonderful. I hope that answers your question. And uh, the last question, um, can you compare or contrast active C, the POC C, versus water extractable organic carbon, carbon part of Haney test? Thanks. I don't know that much about the Haney test, so I won't comment specifically on that test because I don't have enough knowledge. But in general, there are there is a part of soil carbon um, that's measured. It's called dissolved organic carbon. So it's really what would leach off of a soil when wetted. Sometimes you can use water. Sometimes in the lab, they use a, a salt solution. And it is an important way to look at what uh, carbon compounds may be microbially available because they dissolve in solution. They are more available to your microbes. Um, I think mineralizable carbon is slightly different in that, well, it probably includes DOC in large part. So I would say if there was like a Venn diagram or maybe if this is uh, mineralizable carbon, a fraction of that would be the DOC. But yeah, again, I don't know that much about the Haney methods or, or what they're getting at with that test. Thank you. Okay, on to soil nitrogen. Um, the inorganic pools are frequently measured because those are the ones that are plant available. So for example, ammonium and nitrate, the two most important things for crop production are inorganic pools of nitrogen, and those should be measured often. Some people even measure them many, many times throughout our growing season. One challenge is that they change really frequently. So if you measure it in March, it could be entirely different based on temperature and rainfall by April. So that is one of the reasons people measure frequently. And I, I have the optimal range here because you definitely want to be careful with having too much inorganic nitrogen. It can lead to many, many environmental problems, things like eutrophication or groundwater contamination. And, and of course, um, there are regulations around that. So you definitely want to aim for enough for your crops, but not too much. Then there are the organic nitrogen pools. These are not plant available. However, they can become plant available through microbial mineralization. So there are tests like potentially mineralizable nitrogen or ACE protein that help measure how much nitrogen is in those pools and can serve as a proxy for how much may become available to your crops over the growing season. And together, this makes up total nitrogen, which is commonly measured. You can pay for a test that usually measures total nitrogen and total carbon, you get both results from the same test. And that includes all of your nitrogen pools. So let's talk a little bit more about those measurements. Potentially mineralizable nitrogen is the plant available nitrogen released over time in controlled conditions. So like mineralizable carbon, these are typically done in incubations. You can see from this photo, these are actually wetted soils sealed in a plastic bag. There are aerobic and anaerobic versions of this test. You do wanna measure this somewhat often because it does help you make crop management decisions. If you have a lot of organic nitrogen in your soil, you likely need to fertilize less over your growing season because your soil can supply some of that. Um, and it, yeah, it helps you measure how much nitrogen the soil may provide. A soil protein is another form of nitrogen in your soil that comes from the proteins in soil organic matter. This is not available as, uh, at as many labs. It's a newer way to look at soil nitrogen. So you'd need to find a lab that does offer new soil health indicators. 
But because proteins supply, uh, contain nitrogen, they can also be mineralized for plant uptake throughout the growing season. And ACE soil protein may also relate to mycorrhizal fungi and aggregate stability because some of these compounds have been found to be stickier or help glue soil particles together. And we will talk about that a little bit later. And this has also been shown to be sensitive to management changes. So again, if you're a producer who has recently made a change on your farm, soil organic matter, which is perhaps the most important measurement, may not be the best to uh, measure that change. And this is one that may help you see an impact of your work. So now I want to get into the brave new world of soil biology. As I showed on one of my first slides, there are a million different measurements you could take to measure soil biology. And I want to start by saying that even though soil microbes are the powerhouse for all ecosystem services and are incredibly important, some of these measurements can also be incredibly confusing. So I always like to encourage people to measure them if it's fun or interesting, but don't feel like you must in order to be doing good soil health management. And we'll talk a little bit about that as I introduce some of these um, microbial measurements. So probably my favorite of the microbial measurements is phospholipid fatty acids. These are unique markers in cell walls of specific microbial groups. So what you get from this measurement is uh, you can get total biomass, so you can understand just how many microbes are there, and rough community composition. So if you are looking for specific species within your soil, PLFA will not give you that information because it measures groups, of uh, taxonomic groups. So um, for example, fungi versus bacteria. And that is one really interesting data point you can get from PLFA is the ratio of different groups within your soil, fungal to bacterial, Cells that have undergone uh, maybe nutrient or water shortages have very specific stress markers in their cell walls, so you can get a sense of how many of your microbes may be stressed. That's a definite oversimplification, and any microbial ecologists in the room are, are cringing probably because that's um, a very simple way to think about it. But there's a lot of evidence to suggest that these phospholipid fatty acids show um, water or nutrient shortages in your soil. And another really cool thing about PLFA is that phospholipid fatty acids are short-lived. So when you take a measurement, you are seeing who is currently in your soil. That's different from DNA sequencing, where DNA actually lasts quite a long time in your soil. So when you take these measurements, you're seeing both who is currently there and who may have been there for generations past. You get dead and alive organisms when you DNA sequence. So DNA sequencing is uh, definitely on the more expensive end of soil tests you could take. I recommend if this is of interest to you, working with your extension agents or somebody who's trained in interpreting these results, they can be very, very complicated. And it's also very expensive and not a lot of labs do it. So um, when you DNA sequence, you can measure the presence of a specific species, you can measure their activity, so looking for specific functional traits along the uh, DNA, and you can also look for a specific species or try to capture a signature for the entire community, and that's referred to as metagenomics. Again, very complicated data that can be difficult to make um, management decisions based off of. So. Recently, I've been at conferences where um, there are presenters who are really, really uh, pushing this expensive, uh, complicated technique, and I never want to discourage anyone from intellectual investigation. But again, don't feel like you have to take DNA sequences to know your soil. You as the land manager know your soil better than anybody, probably by looking at the earthworms just as well. So. The last soil biological measurement I want to talk about is soil enzymes. I also really love these measurements. You can look at the presence or activity of specific enzymes. Uh, there are different tests for different enzymes, so it can be challenging 
to know what enzyme you want to measure. If you are interested in phosphorus cycling, you may want to measure phosphatase. If you're looking at um, carbon cycling, you may want to look at beta glucosidase. There are a lot. So it's important to have a specific question in mind or work with somebody who knows which enzymes are of interest for you in your system. Uh, and again, don't feel like you must measure these. If you are having phosphorus shortages, maybe phosphatase is something that you could measure because it's of interest to you and your management. Um, but yes, it's important to pursue with specific questions in mind. Okay, now we're gonna get into some soil physical properties. Bulk density is a measure of the mass of soil and a specified volume. A lot of people in the room have used the WSDA bulk density probes in our project. So you know that this requires specialized sampling equipment and can be intensive to measure. You can also measure bulk density with uh, resistance penetrometers in the field. A lot of conservation districts may have one of those available to you, so you don't need to buy your own. Um, this is an important measure that is really a proxy for compaction. You will probably notice that you have um, a much denser soil in your furrows than in your crop rows. And so if you are struggling with compaction, it may be an important metric to measure and measure over time as you try to control this uh, with management. So more soil organic matter will impact your bulk density. So there's always ways to improve it over time. But again, this also has some inherent limitations from texture and structure. Um, bulk density has a lot of impacts on soil hydrology, as well as things like root growth and aeration. Aggregate stability is my favorite soil health indicator. I think it has such a easy to understand uh, impact on your soil or a way to interpret your soil. So what it is, is really just an aggregate's resistance to degradation in water. An aggregate being a small uh, unit of, of soils that are held together with microbial glues uh, and root exudates, all kinds of the interesting sticky compounds in your soils, which hold the sand, silt, and clay particles together. This is a newer measurement in some labs. So you definitely wanna make sure that it's offered the lab by the lab you send your soils to, it can be a little bit uh, expensive. And again, it's impacted by micro microbes, plants, porosity, and management. And what it helps you understand about your soil is how resistant your soil is to uh, degradation, either from surface runoff or erosion. And it also can tell you how protected your carbon is, how protected your microbial communities are, uh, the more stable your aggregates are, the more likely they are to hold on to some of those really important soil resources like carbon and microbes. There are a lot of different methods to measure aggregate stability. So make sure when you're comparing your soil to somebody else's that you have used the same method because they can lead to really different results. And that's something even in our state of the soils project we are grappling with right now is that different labs have different methods and the results aren't necessarily interoperable. Um, but one really cool way that you can measure your own aggregate stability for free is by downloading the Slake smartphone app. And it will guide you through a process uh, by taking pictures of soil aggregates as they dissolve in water and help you understand how stable your soil aggregates are. So uh, bottom right is a link to that. And here's a picture of aggregates that I just think is really cute and want to show that here on the left, bottom left, you have your sand, silt, and clay particles. And it is through the plant and microbe uh, interactions that soils become soil aggregates. There are also a lot of measurements of soil hydrology, but I am coming up on the end of my presentation. So I'm just gonna list them here and not talk about them too much. Um, but each of these has important implications for soil hydrology and crop production and can be measured in multiple ways. So um, if you take away nothing from this presentation today, but this slide, I think it will have been a success. So I want to revisit some of the uh, some of the overarching principles of of getting and interpreting quality results. The first being that context matters. 
not all soils are created equally. And I think I, I hope I talked about that throughout each of the different indicators. They are impacted by inherent properties like climate and soil texture and soil age, as well as by management. So don't be alarmed if your soil is below the optimal range for some indicators. The goal is to see how far you can take your soil with management, but know that there are inherent limitations. And we also wanna be consistent. It's important to sample at the same time each year and send your samples to the same labs that are using the same methods. Soils are really dynamic and heterogeneous. They change by, some of the indicators change by season, some change by day or night. So you really wanna pick a method and stick to it. And you also wanna keep good records of your lab results over time so that you can see how it's changing with your management. Again, remember the basics you can be sold a lot of very, very expensive tests, but the old school measurements are still the most important in many, many ways. pH, texture, and soil organic matter. If you are interested in tracking change, there are also things like poxy or ACE protein. New indicators are constantly being developed, but you don't have to measure all of them or let the process overwhelm you. You also wanna be patient because some metrics, like I mentioned with soil organic matter, may not change as quickly as you'd like based on management. And this is why tracking them over time is important, but it's also important to stay patient with us, the soil scientists, because we're also working on figuring out how all of these indicators work together to provide an overall picture of soil health. We are definitely on this journey together. And then finally, you should have fun. Exploring soil health can unlock new ways to understand your soil. Uh, but remember that you know your soil better than anyone. So if the process isn't enjoyable, let's work together and figure out how to make it so. Lots of useful resources here, uh, soil test interpretation guides, soil health indicator guides. Uh, the one at the far right is a QR code to WSDA's soil health sampling procedure. That's where you can learn all about the best ways to take a soil sample. I didn't have time to go over that today. And then I didn't leave a ton of time for questions, but I did leave my email address here. So I would love to talk soils with anyone, anytime. Feel free to reach out and uh, hopefully we can get in some questions in this last period of time. Well, thank you, Danny. Wonderful um, information and presentation. In case folks didn't see, I did uh, include in the chat your slide deck as the PDF document that you were so graciously offering. Um, just as a reminder, we are recording the presentation um, and we will have that made available on the CTD training library. Um, I had put that link in the chat. I encourage you to click on the link and bookmark that um, in your browser so you can return to that. I believe Danny, you had mentioned that you would also be uh, sending this out via your Soil Health Initiative newsletter. Is that correct? Um, whose link I just put in there with your contact info. Is that is that correct? Yeah, that's great. I will uh, drop a link in the chat right now to how to sign up for our newsletter, but there is a quarterly newsletter um, that has tons of information and resources for everyone. Awesome. Yeah, so between the training library at the CTD web link that I had provided, I can put it up here again as well. Um, you can just visit that by going to the waCTD.org and clicking resources and you'll see the training library in there. Um, between that uh, and the newsletter, um, we will get this out to all of you um, so that you can have access to the information uh, because I know that was a lot of great information <laughs> and folks want to make sure to capture that and, and be able to reference that. So here is the, the training library direct link. Um, and Danny just put the soil health newsletter link there too, as well. Does anyone have any um, other questions? We do have just a couple more minutes until we're at the top of the hour. Uh, this would be a great opportunity now to ask those. Give folks a, a chance to think. I know I learned something new. I really appreciate, you know, having someone with your knowledge base here explaining some of the concepts when I go to things like the Soil Web app and 
um, and looking at the soil test results and kind of making a little bit more sense to some of those numbers. So uh, I have a couple thank yous here to you. That's great. Yeah. And for anyone who's received a soil health report through our project, um, I tried to kind of connect some of the descriptions that were in those reports, but um, we're also innovating those reports all of the time. So if you continue to participate in our soil sampling project, you'll see that those interpretations change and we're trying to provide new decision support tools over time as well. All right, well, if anyone, um, if there's no questions, I guess we're ending a couple minutes early. <laughs> um, thank you again to, to Danny um, and to Karen as well. Um, really appreciate you all staying with us this time, this whole time together and uh, look forward to the next webinar together. Thank you everyone.